welcome and thanks for being our first guest. We were really excited to start bringing in community guests who could help us to learn what's already going on and how our committee can further other organizations' goals and support other organizations' goals. So, so you're our first visitor and we're really excited to have you. So welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. If you would like, so I did put together some slides just to keep my thoughts straight. If you'd like to give me the ability to share my screen, which I think is just to make me a co-host, I can do that. I can certainly try. And I am grateful that Jane, Humera, and Amy are here. So Ms. Lanham is a teacher and the advisor to the Diversity Club at Hopkins Academy and a high quality educator. And of course, Humera is on the school committee and she's done a tremendous amount of work with the school committee in collaboration with the school committee, but she really was the person that brought um, the initial language for and the idea of uh, anti-racist resolution, which the school committee adopted before the school committee. So I'm glad that they are all, that they are both here, three, all three of them are here. And of course, Jane is very active as a liaison from the town to the school committee. So I will, um, yeah, if you want me to share the screen, otherwise I don't need to, I can just speak about what's on the slides, that's fine but too. Unfortunately, I'm not don't designated worry. the host of this meeting, so I'm not able to. Do not worry, really. I mean, actually, it probably saves me from having one of my Zoom screen share guests that um, <laughs> Humera Jane and Amy have probably seen way too much of. So, Andy, what? I could, um, if it's the presentation that you shared with us, I can share that if you want. Yes, sure. That might, and then I, it might be helpful. So, I'm not go. just saying it. That's great. Yeah, it's that blue and yellow. Yeah, hold, hold on, let Perfect. me, let See, me just pull that up really. Whenever quick. you're in a jam, call a teacher. For anything, like if you need a plumber, I don't know. If you need anything, call a teacher. Thanks, Amy. Except yeah, actually, it'll just take a moment for me. No worries. To pull up. Okay. No worries. And I'll start talking a little bit about the um, vision. Oh, wait. I, You're going to have the same problem, right? Go too soon. It's no not letting me either. No Kayla, worries. do you know who the host is? Uh, you know what? It's saying that I can share the screen. Um, <laughs> Okay, okay, good. Kayla, look and see if you have a thing that says security at the bottom. <laughs> and the same line with participants and chat. Yeah, my, so it says the host disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah, they probably did that on the um, and there's and you don't have the ability to make me a co-host when you go near my name you I don't. and see more. You don't. I've okay, done, no worries. I've done that. Do not worry. Okay, no big deal. Um, so let me minimize this screen so I can see what I'm talking about. All right, so I will start with just the vision of the school district. Um, so our vision is that Hadley uh, Public Schools. At Hadley Public Schools, we seek to educate students to understand and contribute positively to a global society. And we're guided by the mission to provide a safe and supportive environment that fosters cooperation, critical thinking, creativity, integrity, and a love of learning. And we're committed to creating a diverse, equitable, inclusive, and anti-racist learning community. And that was specifically added to um, our vision statement for the school district this year. So what are some of the strategies that we are, that are underway and things that we've built on? This isn't all just work that we started this year. As I already pointed out, Amy Lanham, who is at this meeting, is the advisor to the diversity club. She's held that role for quite a while. So our students and our faculty have been engaged in this work for a long period of time. And I would say that probably, I, I would describe our, our experience, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't speak for others. I would just describe our experience as widespread commitment with pockets of um, kind of intense activity. And what we want to move toward is kind of more 
uniform, consistent activity, action across the district that reflects that commitment. So we want to build our capacity, um, our fire, our capacity, our skills to be so that we can act in accordance with the values and the vision that we espouse. So I said our, our vision is about creating an environment in which that is diverse, equitable, inclusive, and anti-racist. And so we want to move from having these pockets of impactful practice, this Lennon's Diversity Club being one of them, to a more kind of widespread action across the district. And what are uh, some of the ways in which we've engaged our stakeholders? So we recognize that diversity, equity, and inclusion and anti-racism are both strategies and goals. So it's important to have the goal of having a being a diverse, equitable, and inclusive community that's committed to anti-racism. It's important to have that goal. It's important to state that goal. But as I said, it also has to inform action. So it has to be both strategy and goal. And as I've said, what we aspire to create communities that are diverse, equitable, inclusive, and anti-racist. Recognize that we are never done. And this is something that I think is difficult for most organizations. And um, sometimes it feels really difficult in schools because we can just be inundated with a long list of all kinds of things we need to do to be in compliance with state mandates, with regulations, to keep up with recommendations about um, effective pedagogy and high quality practice in school. So we're constantly kind of adopting new things and trying new things and more and more gets added to the list. And there's sometimes a desire to just, just check things off, like we did that. So it's really tempting to say, we had a professional development on diversity, so we should be good. We're good, we did the PD this year, we're good. We adopted this piece of paper, we're good. And I don't think that comes from a place of people not caring. I think it comes from the reality of feeling like, gosh, I, I, I've got to get this done. But this work is never done, right? It's, it's always aspirational. We're always on a journey, individually and collectively. We're constantly improving and we're just never done and that's okay. And both of our school councils have made diversity, equity and inclusion a priority this year and incorporated specific goals and outcomes in their school strategy documents to reflect that. So what are some of our emerging goals and strategies for this work? We wanna make sure that we meaningfully engage communities of color and traditionally underrepresented communities. Um, traditionally underrepresented communities in the school district really could be defined as just about anything other than white. Um, and well, I'll leave it at, at when I'm talking about race and ethnicity as white. And I say that because Hadley Elementary School is 74% white and I believe Hopkins Academy is 76%. So three quarters of our student body um, identify as white uh, when they're asked for demographic information. Um, so we're trying to engage all kinds of stakeholders and, in, and engage communities of color and traditionally underrepresented communities. We wanna make sure we hire, train and promote a racially, ethnically and linguistically diverse workforce. That is something we do not have in Hadley Public Schools. Uh, it's a, this isn't, this is just a statement of fact, not an excuse for anything. It's a priority for the state. Uh, to, for, by and large, the educator workforce is um, white and still majority female. Uh, create equitable access to academic and extracurricular opportunities for all students. So we don't want any sort of barrier, whether that's financial. We don't want people to feel like they don't belong. They don't have access. Allocate resources to advance racial equity. So we very much want to demonstrate when we build our budgets and we um, pursue funding in the form of grant funding. We wanna make sure that we're allocating resources in a way that demonstrate that this is a priority for us. And we're committed to collecting, counting, and comparing data related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. So what are some examples of how we've done this work? Again, we are far from finished, but some examples for each one of these and what we see as some 
work ahead in the near term. Engaging communities of color. So we have created for the first time this year an English language learner parent advisory council. This is a community that can feel uh, easily feel very marginalized. We do not have very many bilingual staff in the district. Although in each of our schools, about 11% of the population um, identify as speaking a language or even more than that, as speaking a language other than English, we have very few bilingual staff. This year we did create what's called an LPAC, an English Language Learner Parent Advisory Council. We have always had a special education parent advisory council, and that's a way to help us improve programs and outcomes for students with disabilities. Our work ahead is, I, I see it's critical that we encourage people from underrepresented groups to run for school committee, participate in school councils, lead school and district improvement efforts, and I would say to participate in all forms of local government. As I look across um, the, yeah, across all kind of different, uh, what I want to say, boards and groups, um, diversity is something that I think all, all the boards in town can benefit from. We want to collect data, interviews, focus groups, and surveys on the experiences of, of people from communities of color and underrepresented groups in our district and schools. Hopkins Academy, I believe, will be undertaking some of this work with, um, in collaboration with the uh, the Collaborative for Educational Services this spring. Um, and we wanna make sure we start capturing kind of the lived experiences. We have a lot of quantitative data about outcomes for students and participation rates, but we wanna make sure we capture people's actual experiences. And uh, creating stipend positions for family outreach and engagement, coordinators and specialists, um, coaches that can help teachers plan lessons with an eye on anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. To hire, train, and promote a diverse workforce. So we have started explicitly stating the district's commitment to these, to these values in our job postings. We tell people we want them to be familiar with the school committee's anti-racist resolution. We want them to be familiar with our vision and each school strategy document, and to be thinking critically before, if they're called for an interview, before they come about how their experience, their knowledge, um, and their, their own values align with the priorities of the district. Uh, providing opportunities for faculty and staff to increase their understanding. This is work that's underway. We have had professional development workshops that have offered our faculty and staff opportunities to learn more about culturally responsive pedagogy. Um, we will be having our second one of those at Hadley Elementary School this Friday. Um, we'll have one at Hadley Elementary School on microaggressions uh, this Friday as well. And um, our work ahead is to build on that work, to expand some of those professional development opportunities, um, to continually assess recruitment and retention data and the experiences of our employees, data on the experiences of our employees. Uh, we plan and we've budgeted to work with consultants to improve our practices around diversity, equity, and inclusion next fiscal year. And uh, we're looking at developing for our, our faculty uh, kind of an alternative complaint resolution mechanism. Um, and that's something that the Harvard Business Review and the article that I shared with all of you talks about as a practice uh, that can support diversity and inclusion efforts to create equitable access for our students. Some of the examples of things that we that are already underway, early college high school, that's an opportunity at Hopkins Academy. And, and the crux of that program, it's really about providing opportunities for students who are traditionally underrepresented in higher education. And that that is students from low socioeconomic, uh, who have qualified as having low socioeconomic status, or um, black indigenous people of color. Um, it's about actively recruiting students from these communities to take college courses while they're still in high school. Uh, just this Thursday, the entire district, all students will have the opportunity to participate in virtual discussions on black history and experiences. I really wanna thank Principal Dowd at Hadley Elementary School for essentially being the lead on that and coordinating all of that. We've invested in what are called tiered systems of support. So trying to ensure that every student gets what they need to, to grow academically and socially. 
Uh, so we've invested in those systems. We've invested in restorative justice. Principal Camuso at Hopkins Academy is expanding some of that work and building on some of that work and in positive behavioral interventions and supports. That's about explicitly teaching children how to be a part of a positive community and contribute to a positive community. And we have in the past invested in intergroup dialogue. Actually, Ms. Lanham was a critical person in that experience. We were able to have 12 middle school students and 12 high school students, I think about that number, uh, learn, go through the process of intergroup dialogue facilitation. That's about teaching people how to communicate across difference. So it's really about teaching people the difference between discussion and debate, uh, becoming aware of our tendency to judge and need to convince people to think like we do in order to feel safe, and rather to lean into people with genuine curiosity, a, a sincere desire to understand to come from a place of empathy and to try to build bridges of relationship and understanding. Three of our students who participated in that, in seventh grade, there were seventh graders when they did this, uh, ended up being invited to participate in what is a national, to some extent international conference that happens every two years at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. They were part of a panel presentation. They got phenomenal reviews and have been invited back to participate this year. And so our work ahead is to uh, conduct an equity audit. And that is where you look at, this is what our organization, these are the values that we espouse. And what do the numbers say about the extent to which those values are our reality? So if we say that we're committed to anti-racism, um, to what extent do we see proportionate or disproportionate outcomes for students of color and students from the majority population? Um, if we claim to be a community of inclusion, same thing, to what extent do we see proportionate or disproportionate course enrollments in advanced courses, outcomes for students with disabilities or without, um, rates of participation in extracurricular activities. Um, we look at, again, course enrollment, access to STEM opportunities, science, tech, engineering, and math, post-secondary planning, and then we'll use those findings to understand the conditions that foster and inhibit equitable access and outcomes in our institute. Allocating resources to advance racial equity. So some examples, we secured grant funding a couple years ago for intergroup dialogue training. It was a highly competitive process um, from a foundation and our district was successful and one of the smallest districts to be represented uh, nationally in the work that year. We have included support for consultants and coaches to assist us in this work next year in our FY fiscal year 22 budget. We developed the programs I talked to you about, early college, high school, and innovation pathways programs. And we've dedicated professional development time and resources to help educators better serve students and communities of color. And that work is never done, it's just beginning. And lastly, collecting, counting, and comparing data. The collect, count, and compare is also something that uh, I like the phrase. It comes from Harvard Business Review's article on how to use data to meet your diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. And so really looking at, first of all, paying attention, right? Collecting information. Don't just say, we don't want to say we're committed to something and then never check to see if we're living in accordance with those values. So collect information, qualitative, quantitative, lived experiences, anecdotal and analytical, collect information, pay attention, count, and when there are distinctions, don't just try to explain them away. I will say that all of our school committee is really good at holding us accountable. Humera is excellent at this. Whenever someone wants to say, well, that can be explained by this kind of statistical an anomaly, Humera wants to dig, no, she wants to dive in. She wants to dig dive into the dirt on it. Like she, we can't, we don't get away with just saying, there's probably a reason for that. Um, so collect, count, and then compare. And really ask why. When things are, when we're seeing different experiences and different outcomes for people, um, we need to understand why that is. And make sure that we don't just immediately default to narratives that we may be familiar with, that we may not intend to sound or be harmful. Like, well, we live in a marriage, uh, Merit, merit, 
technocratic, neurocratic, I should have picked a different word if this is being recorded by Hadley Media. Everyone knows what I'm trying to say. We live in that society and we live in a society based on meritocracy. That's a, that's a comfortable narrative. We like that idea, right? Oh, everybody has a fair shot. Everybody just work hard. It's a comfortable narrative that many of us are familiar with. And I'm not saying that people have to just throw that out, but when we immediately pivot to a narrative that doesn't demand that we reflect on and really dig deep and say, is that really it? Is there something else going on here? We just always want to dig deeper. So our work ahead, uh, we want to develop a dashboard. We've seen some great ones across the country and nonprofit and some school districts so that we can present these data in a way that's simple and salient and comparable and that we can regularly put it out in front of the community. Right? Like now well, I, I do this all the time with COVID data, but <laughs> focusing on something, this is critical and important so people can just see it and know uh, what's going on. And we'll always ask ourselves, you know, we see data and we look at data and we need to ask ourselves, okay, what do we see and what do we think it means? And then we hypothesis test from there. Is our understanding accurate? But first you have to be able to see it and everybody has to be able to look at it. And we wanna make sure that we include comprehensive data sets that capture progress on multiple indicators with multiple methods and account for new methods. And so in summary, and thank you for listening, I talked a lot, um, there's three big things that we, we need to focus on and, and, and they don't necessarily just go in order. I'm done with this, I'm done with this, I'm done with this. But one is to make a decision. Like first, you just make a decision. You commit to the work. You say, yes, this is important. This is really important. And we're going to commit to this, even when we're tired, even when we don't know how, even when we have no idea what to do, even when the only thing that feels certain is that we might fail. We commit, we commit, we refuse to, we just commit and we're undaunted by it. And then act with what I call bold incrementalism. So, um, be fearless, to, be fearless in the smallest steps. So we don't have to do everything all at once. We don't have to, that's easy, you know, it's easy then to feel overwhelmed and say, well, this is so complicated and so hard and how are we gonna, how am I gonna solve racism in, you know, a month or a week or with a strategic plan? And then just to quit because it feels too overwhelming. We say, no, this, this really matters. And I may not be able to do everything. And I may not be able to do 10 things today, but I can do one thing. I can do one thing. And when I do one thing with a group of other equally committed people, um, we can build a lot of momentum and energy around that. So we just have to commit, we have to then act and we need to encourage one another, like keep it up, keep it up, don't give up. It, it matters, it's important. Um, we're all contributing to a better, brighter, more just future, right? Something that will benefit us all and we can all be proud of. So we encourage each other and we evaluate our work uh, and our own individual behavior and practices um, with, without fear and without shame, right? We expect that we're going to make mistakes. We just commit, refuse to quit, keep encouraging each other, keep acting and encouraging, and then increase our tolerance for the truth um, and just keep getting better. And that more or less sums up what's happening in the schools, more or less. Thank you so much. Your passion and your humility come through and, it, and it's exciting to hear about all of this. And uh, so I'm glad that uh, to hear all this and also to have a chance to maybe ask some questions. And I, I know I have one, so I'll kick off, but I hope other people will have questions as well. I'd be curious to know about some of the curriculum initiatives that might be happening in the schools so that children who are growing up now grow up with different understandings than children who grew up in an earlier time. Mm -hmm. So both of the school councils have this year have started talking about what about anti-racist curriculum. I will also say to you though that one of our starting points that's important to us and the elementary school is actually going to be kind of 
pulling apart something called a culturally responsive scorecard. A group of educators at NYU put something together that allow, it's actually a, a booklet and a process. I can send a link out to the group afterwards that um, encourages groups of stakeholders to come together and, it, and look at curriculum and instructional resources in schools and evaluate them for things like representation, who is represented in these materials, to what extent do they represent um, a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So one thing we're mindful of is we don't discount the importance of adopting an anti-racist curriculum. We also are really clear that we do not want people to see it as this course over here. Like I took this course and everything's good now. We do this for 15 minutes a day and everything's good now. We, um, we think that all of our practices, every time we engage, we engage with students, we engage with each other, we need to be mindful of this work and every, everything that students use to learn. So from how their classroom is decorated and what images they see on the walls to the books that are available to read when I finish up my work early to the textbooks, not just the content, but the representation in the textbooks. Who are the images of in those textbooks? Whose history is being told in those, in those textbooks? To what extent are perspectives other than the dominant culture's perspective represented? So we just wanna make sure that we don't see it as this box over here like anti-racism curriculum is one textbook over here and Monday at two is when you learn how to do that. And then the rest of the time, we just subconsciously consume all kinds of material and we don't pay any attention to it. We don't wanna do that. I don't wanna put Amy on the spot, but I'm gonna get this wrong. And I will say the English department at Hopkins Academy can provide an excellent example of this because they went through their reading list. Am I correct, Amy? And you folks, well, your class, actually, you got rid of a book that kids were reading and replaced it with something. Can I, can I just ask you to comment on that? And I know you guys, uh, and you also changed some of your courses for next year. Yeah, so we've um, done quite a lot of retooling our curricula over the last several years. Um, one course change that uh, Mr. Breland, who's the other English teacher right now, and I have made is that we had had a course called American Literature and then also a course called Ethnic American Literature. And what we felt was inappropriate about, inappropriate about that is the assumption might be that Ethnic American Literature is voices of people of color and American literature is just like white people, which isn't what um, is actually in the curriculum. There's obviously a range of voices in American literature as well, but it didn't make sense to frame it in that way. So we're changing those courses and making it like early American and late American so that it's chronological rather than sounding as if um, we're looking at two different voices because that wasn't representing what we were doing anyway. Um, we also have done, I mean, I'm not sure, I've definitely done course audits for my courses where I create spreadsheets and look at the representation of the subject matter and the authors. So making sure that there's a variety of voices in terms of the actual authors and also making sure there's a variety of subject matter. So even if you might have like a white female author, maybe she's writing about an experience in a community in India. So she's giving some insight and some direct quotes from that community. So um, we're looking at it in a couple of different ways. And then we're also trying to integrate, um, you know, more modern nonfiction kind of sources. So for example, um, I integrate a lot of TED Talks and podcasts into my curriculum. So we've been, I've been introducing a lot of Ibram X. Kendi's work, um, especially in my AP language course, which Ada, um, who is here today, is uh, exposed to. So um, yeah, it's, it's just a matter of making sure that we try to cover all the bases of human experience and be continuously cognizant of what we're doing and having a purpose behind each text, if that makes sense. So helpful, Amy, thank you. And you just gave so many examples of, again, we don't, I'll speak for myself, I don't, I don't want to diminish the 
critical importance of treating anti-racism as a content and a skill set and dispositions, critically important. And we also want to make sure that people, our students and ourselves, that we're aware that this happens, like bias is happening all the time, right? The things I notice and more importantly, the things I don't notice, right? Uh, it's happening all the time. And we just want to make sure that, that we don't communicate by creating a, a subject, a place, this course here that, well, I pay attention to it over here and then I'm kind of all set. And then I just go back to doing what I do. What other questions do people have? Yeah, so uh, this is Wayne Abercrombie, whose name is not on the screen. <laughs> Hi, Wayne. <laughs> I have a question. Um, relating, uh, sort of following on from what Amy was talking about in the English curriculum, uh, I just am curious what other areas, like I know every so often in social media, I'll see some post about, well, here's a black scientist you never heard about in school. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I never did. Um, so I'm wondering if like in science and, you know, the things that we don't think of as history and literature, uh, are those subjects also um, incorporating this kind of stuff? Thanks. Hi, uh, yes. So thank you for that question, Sarah. It's an excellent question. Yes. And this is another example of where I said that what I think is a general commitment to these values. And then Amy gave a perfect example, an individual teacher like Amy who says, I'm passionate about this and I feel responsibility. So I do my own course audit. So individual teachers, yes, across subjects are asking those questions. Um, I've also spoken with teachers about the idea that, um, I mean, there's there, even, even the math problems that uh, we choose to, that we choose for children to wrestle with. Um, there, are, there are opportunities to learn a skill and to learn the content of mathematics and um, also learn things about human experience in a statistics class in, in any math class. So as far as doing it, have what we don't have, Sarah, is a, this is the, the kind of the district approach and schedule for making sure that analysis happens. So we have really uh, a lot of really excellent teachers, a lot of folks like, like Amy, what she said, nobody told her, you should go off and audit your courses. Amy did that, right? Because she's committed to this and she did it, but the district didn't say, let's make sure we get this done. She didn't need me to say that, but just to make sure that it's happening consistently across the board and then creating space for educators to talk about what they see and what they think it means, right? That's equally important. So that not individual educators are not just doing this work in isolation and making these discoveries, but then as a community, they can come together and say, what does this mean? So our goal, that's part of what, the culturally responsive curriculum scorecard is, is a way of, of doing kind of like collective analysis together and then talking about those results together. And that's, that's a direction that the district is, is headed in. How do we do this work more in community and hold ourselves publicly accountable um, to make sure that we're consistently doing it and have transparent conversations about what we discover and what we think that means. I wanted to ask uh, Amy and also you, Anne, uh, what kinds of responses you have gotten from students in the school to this, this approaches? I think Ada, as a student in the school, might be best suited to answer that question. Ada, maybe you could give us some insight on what you're seeing in your courses. Um, um, I know that the courses and the, the curriculum work that you guys have been doing has been like, I mean, great for me. It's always just so interesting and, and awesome to hear like different perspectives and, um, and whatnot. And I'm positive that my peers also really enjoy it and like really appreciate the work that's being done to, to give us like all of this, um, diversity in our 
in our learning experiences. Um, I, my friend and I did a survey for one of our AP Lang projects that we sent out to a bunch of students about their experiences with um, diversity at Hopkins. And I think one of the big things that they said was that the curriculum has, you know, has become more open and more diverse and um, has been, they've been a lot, very receptive to it. And I think they think that the teachers have been receptive to like the current environment and the current uh, political happenings of the world. And I think like, yeah, I think people are having a, ha uh, having a good relationship with that right now. Yeah, jump in, Pat. Okay, thank you. Um, this is just excellent. I really appreciate this, Superintendent McKenzie, your thoughtful, you know, commentary and the comprehensive nature of it. And um, my question has to do with the, um, it's an inclusion question. Um, at a school that is, um, you know, 70, around 75% majority white, um, what kinds of strategies do you use as a district for students who might um, be challenged to feel a sense of belonging um, and may be experiencing peer-to-peer -peer, um, microaggressions? Are there systems in, in the schools to address those two um, somewhat related, but somewhat not experiences of a student being in the minority? Yes, you're going to start to think that Amy's the only employee at Hopkins Academy, but she's not. There are others. <laughs> um, there are just, I'm going to get the timing off on this, Amy, but a few years ago, and Ada, you might have been part of it. A few years ago, the students put together, I believe you were part of it. I know April was before she became the principal. And it was a, a form of kind of an alternative, alternative complaint resolution system. It had a better name than that, but it allowed um, students to seek out a trusted adult. And the purpose of the kind of the plan in the document was to name some of those people. And that came from student input. And then to make sure that those adults understood how and why they might be called upon. And so a student could bring to the adult, I observed this, I experienced this, I'm uncomfortable with this, to bring anything. And instead of the typical channels that particularly at a middle high school is, there's one channel, it's the principal's office, maybe a guidance counselor's office. And it always requires like physically even going through these spaces that are very public and there's all kinds of perhaps interpretations associated with who goes in there and why they go in there and what does it mean? And so the faculty with students put together this, again, this was, a couple of years ago, maybe even three years ago. So that that was really, I have to say that was pretty, that was extremely cutting edge because that that kind of thing is being talked about regularly now, but it wasn't then. Um, but to support students, I would say the work of the diversity club has been instrumental. It has been deemed so effective that the elementary school is looking to extend down. So to have a diversity club at Hadley Elementary School and their school council made that one of the goals and priorities this year is to take the work of the Hopkins Academy Diversity Club and start filtering that down. And I believe that that is a space where those students aren't responsible for policing, fixing, or you know being in charge of the culture. They, they have been a terrific source of guiding the district, guiding the schools in where there are problems, where people may feel, um, where, where we have issues with microaggressions, where people may feel as though they aren't a part of, they aren't being uh, supported or represented, or they may identify inequities. Um, so now I would say that the best work has been initiated by the students and they have these dedicated caring adults who have helped them kind of move that work forward. I think about the gender equity group that started a few years ago. That was, you know, that was 100% students started and then some adults stepped in and helped them and they did, 
They did tremendous work. As a result of they, their work, we rewrote parts of both handbooks, uh, HES and HA student handbooks. They presented to the school committee. Okay, so, um, but we need more systems. So we need, we need more systems. And some of that goes to educating everybody on, so educating everybody on what we mean by these things. Like, what do we mean by microaggressions? What are examples of those? How do they happen? And one of the ways of understanding how they happen in our school, in our schools, is about collecting information on the lived experiences of those people who are in the school. That's part of trying to get that interview and focus group data uh, this, this spring um, in a more formal way and using a, a third party to really, in the hopes that that encourages people to be brutally honest about their experiences. You know, sometimes people may wanna hold back because they make excuses for the folks around them. Like, well, I know they don't mean it. I know they care and I know. Um, so we're hoping to really get at the truth of folks lived experiences. And then from that design systems that respond to the problems, um, to the conditions in our culture that, um, that impede inclusion and equity. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, jump in. Thank you. Uh, before I forget, I want to say, you know, just I uh, echo everyone's um, uh, excitement with you joining us and all this, all the information that you're sharing us and uh, all the great stuff going on. I, I guess I, I had a two part question. Um, and if you've already touched on it, and I uh, then maybe you could just sum it up um, is I think the 75% and or the 73 and 76% that I heard, um, assuming that was student body, and I wondered, uh, what reflection the, uh, if you've looked at the faculty and administration in those um, um, educational settings that the children see um, and where that stands and what your goals are there. Um, and then the second part was, um, uh, do you feel supported in the school system by the Hadley community at large? And if not, what, um, do you have any suggestion how we could help or spur any other efforts? Um, so uh, three things. One, thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind words you had to say. I do want to just remind everybody here, everybody in this group has been so kind and, and complimenting me. I'm reporting on the work of other people and that's not being falsely self-deprecating. I mean, I might be giving a good report, I'm sure Nelson Mandela's biographers wrote great books, but at the end of the day, we don't say, wow, that guy had a great biographer. So the real work is being done by the folks that I'm talking about. Um, in terms of staff, uh, our staff is, I don't have the exact percentage, but I tell you it's even more white than our student body. Uh, so it would, I mean, I would say it's, it's more than 75%. So it's, it's whiter than the student body. And uh, it is something that we, we want to address it. So why it's one of the goals that we've listed in terms of recruit, retain um, a staff and a staff and faculty that is more reflective of our student body. So we're even, and even I would argue we want it, our staff uh, to be more diverse than, than the student body. Uh, and the other thing that can be not shocking, but troubling, right, is that diversity the less money people make, the more diversity you see. So if you look at the positions within the organization, right? So similar to society, there's a disproportionate representation of where you see the greatest diversity is in um, where in the lower salaries, right? So that's even something else to look at. There's the overall number, right? There's the overall number, but that's not enough. We also have to say, and then what happens even so, we have recruited and retained more diversity in the staff, but where are we pulling them in and what's going on with wages? We have a long way to go there, a long way to go. Do uh, I personally, in 
terms of my work of leading the, the district and the schools, do I feel supported by the Hadley community? I absolutely, I do. And there have been times that, um, you know, even when it's been hard. So, uh, you know, we, we had a, we had a bit of a hard time my very first year in the district. It's not hard to look up uh, articles and letters to the editor in the Hampshire Gazette. The very first time that there was a diversity club that was started by a, a, a faculty member who was actually a, somebody that was coming in and doing their, their practicum, an intern for us, a really skilled individual. And um, when some students told the truth about their experience, it was really hard for a lot of people to hear. It's really hard because so what they were hearing, this, this, the, not just this one child, but several children, what they were hearing from children about their experiences didn't match, I imagine, who they wanted to be collectively. And so it was really hard to hear. And um, when things are hard to hear, sometimes we, we get defensive. Uh, sometimes we get even more entrenched in our defensiveness. And sometimes that defensiveness is even expressed as anger that we're being attacked. And in spite of all of that, so even when the work has been hard, even when we've had, we've hit some bumps, we've hit some challenges, uh, I feel supported in the work because well, I'm still here. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's something. Uh, I'm still here. And, um, and that I, I feel as a community that, that people realize that it'll be, there are times it'll be really hard. And there are times that some people won't be ready or that some people will want to resist or that some people will just stop because they're too tired. But as long as some of us keep going and uh, Humera shared a great article, actually Hadley Lone shared a great article about calling in versus calling out. As long as we're continually saying, we all really want the same thing. We all want to feel a sense of significance and belonging. And even more than that, we all want to create that feeling for others, probably more so than we want to experience it ourselves. We wanna be responsible for giving others ease and comfort, support and appreciation. And we just keep calling each other in. We just keep reminding each other, we all want that. This is a community filled with really good people. And um, yeah, so I do feel supported. Even when people are really mad at me, I feel supported. <laughs> are there Thanks. ways that, I'm sorry. Are there ways that our committee can offer support? We have no money and no power, um, but I think we have some goodwill um, mm -hmm. and, and interest. And I'm wondering if there are ways that we can offer real Say, well, one, just inviting us into the conversation as a starting point. I, I think connecting these dots, right? There's this wonderful group, grassroots group, Hadley Learns. Uh, Humara is a key organizer in that, but there are others. It's not like a, a school committee thing. It's definitely a community endeavor. This town committee, we have Hopkins Academy Diversity Club. It's more than a club. It's like a, you know, action group, but... Um, so we have the diversity club and the elementary school. Let's expand that work. Um, so connecting those dots, um, yeah. And I, I don't have an exact answer, but that the willingness, knowing that you're willing and interested in collaborating. Um, I will tell you something just, just quickly that when, when I wrote the grant for the intergroup dialogue, one of the reasons I wrote the grant is I had talked to a small group of students about this work and about what it might mean and we wrote that, gosh, 2017. So it was a time that people were pretty, pretty 2016, 17. So there's a lot of pretty strong opinions floating around. And, um, and it, was, it looked like people weren't capable of talking to one another. And some of the students said to me, 
do you know, like we we've lost faith in the, in adults' ability to have civil conversations with each other. Like we don't see examples of adults being able to talk with each other, right? They can they just get really angry and and go off to their corners and they they can't talk. That was one of the things that motivated uh, me to, to pursue that grant. And um, and at the time, some of the students talked about, and it doesn't have to be this work necessarily, but it just speaks to a general desire. Some of those students talked about wanting to develop those school those skills of dialogue facilitation so that they could facilitate a community dialogue. If they didn't just want to do it in their schools, they wanted to they wanted the adults in the larger community to learn with them about how to how to have a dialogue. Um, so maybe it's something the students are still interested in and it might be worth revisiting. There was a great example of intergroup dialogue that happened actually in Leverett and a group of people, I think from Virginia, West Virginia, came up here and engaged in an intergroup dialogue. It's pretty fascinating. So. And I'm sure there are other things too. I would love to build on your answer, if oh, I may. Oh, please, yeah. Um, I think um, one thing that we perhaps all identify with is the way we were taught history and uh, what we were taught growing up is that we're, we're now realizing that it, it didn't exactly go down the way the history books taught us in school. And, and we are, a group of you know diverse, and I would I might assert quite educated individuals. How could we not know? And yet we look at education at our education institutions and expect them to have all the answers, and still they weren't taught necessarily. It's one of the reasons why we our small community group calls ourselves Hadley Learns because I think if we if we each go on this individual learning journey and go to the communities that we are interacting with, perhaps it's the church group, maybe it's the guys we go bowling with, um, whoever we're Zooming with in a pandemic, <laughs> maybe there's a digital, you know, virtual Zoom uh, bowling taking place. But if we are having this conversation in all corners, then we can tackle the issues of um, creating a more diverse, equitable and inclusive environment along the two important paths as I've come to see it. One is the individual um, acts of racism or bias that we might see. And yes, racism happens in our town, it does. Whether it's microaggressions and death by a thousand cuts or whether it's overt acts of racism, it happens. We've talked with people, we've interviewed people, um, we, we know it happens, it happens in every town. Right? How can we be immune to it? But as Ibrahim X. Kendi says, um, there's another perhaps more important aspect of racism. And that is when uh, he defines it as a, a collection of racist policies that lead to racist ideas that lead to further racist policies. And so it took me a long time and I'm still, I'm still learning myself, but what does that mean? How does that relate to us? Well, we still live governed by racist policies, whether we like it or not, or wanna examine it or wanna really lean in and look at it. And our job is to identify that, examine it, see how, as Annie said, the um, other parts of Hadley might be living and, perhaps not equitably living, how that changes their lived experience and how that might have a ripple effect on their schooling or the way they enjoy uh, other services or just are included in our community. So I, I'm excited about the DEI committee. I realize that there isn't money, but there is a lot of um, goodwill and smart people and so I think there, there's a lot of potential for applying for grants, for creating more conversation in different corners of Hadley, um, where you know 
you know how they say skate to where the puck is, right? Who isn't coming out? Who isn't coming out to these things voluntarily, but might be willing and perhaps is most open-minded uh, having conversations in those spaces. Um, I think that that's how you create fertile ground for um, progress on both the policy side as well as on the uh, inclusion and equity side. Looks like we're out of questions. Well, I have something I'd like to add, and that is my experience in working with the seniors since I've been involved with Hadley Learns is that until you actually talk to someone about this, they don't think about it. It's just not high on anybody's list of interest or things affect them because it doesn't affect them until you tell them it does. And once they understand, then they really get involved. So we need to educate the community. That's not an easy task because they don't wanna change their opinions and they don't wanna get involved, but that's what I think really needs doing. I would also like to, to find a way to make a space for people who are being hurt, who are being uh, treated badly in the community to be heard. Um, it, it strikes me that they don't feel safe saying these things in public places. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for ways that those people can feel heard. That 25%, that 30% of people who experience these kinds, where can they share their experiences? And sounds it, it sounds like you're making those spaces in the schools. And that's what I wish that could be a wider experience in the community. I think it's aspirational. I think there are a lot of really good people who are constantly reminding me and us of that this we need to have those spaces and prove to me that they're there. Um, so the school committee is really good at that as a whole. Um, and that's important. So it's it's we're not done. We're not even close to being done. But I I, I would agree with you. Like um, I mean sometimes you said about not having money. I would say when when I need an ally, I don't ask them how much money they have in their wallet. I just need somebody who believes that my experience matters, who can give voice to my experience when um, an institution or a community has decided that my voice can't or shouldn't be heard. Um, so, yeah. If I may also add to that, um, as a uh, small grassroots collection of people, we've also interviewed people uh, in the community, parents of children, um, people without children who've experienced racism uh, and um, interviewed them and documented their story and um, created um, audio um, in order to protect them. If, they, if they're not comfortable using their own voice, uh, we've, um, we've uh, created, edited down their story uh, with um, someone else's voice uh, to share what might have happened to them. And we have about five or six, uh, about five of those such audios um, thus created and another two in the queue. And um, we, we would be happy to hear more people's stories. We use that, those um, audio clips um, in educational settings where this conversation needs to happen to understand what microaggression looks like. And also sometimes people just need to hear um, because there's still, a, um, there's still a disbelief that it is actually happening in our town, right? So unless you actually hear a story of something that happened right here in Hadley, 
uh, you might not believe it. So um, if you know of such a story um, or know of someone willing to tell their story of, or if you're listening to this on Hadley Media and you're interested in telling your own story in an anonymous way, I encourage anyone to contact me. My email is humera at humera.com. Um, and um, sometimes it's cathartic to tell that story. And other times it's just helpful to know that it's um, uh, getting out there, helping people understand uh, what they shouldn't be doing and how they can help. Thank you. And I, I think our committee has talked about our desire to amplify those voices and to, to serve as allies. Um, without embarrassing her too much, I'll say it always brings me joy to see Ada and know that there are people who are going to be carrying on this this important work long after any of us are able to do so. Um, that mean, that, that's very, very special and moving to me. And um, I, I think our questions have been answered and uh, just like learning, this, this work is never done. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Annie, for being with us and, and teaching us about what's going on and uh, helping us to understand. And we look forward to being, being allies with you and to doing whatever we can to further this really, really important work. Thank you. Thank yeah, you very thank much you. for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Humera, for being here. Thank you, Amy and Ada, for all of your contributions. Like I said it best, uh, I'm the bi biographer of the greats, so I really appreciate it. It's good water to carry, so thanks for that. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And thank you for putting on this first presentation of many, I understand, so that others in Hadley can watch on Hadley Media and learn more about what's going on in our town. And uh, look to the town website. Uh, we're going to be talking with the human resources director and the police chief as well, having similar uh, conversations and learning from them. So thanks everybody. Thanks those at home who are joining us and thank you everybody on the meeting. Be safe, be healthy, take care.